Okay, well, I have six o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. For those of you do, who do not know me, my name is Dr. Jason Bantha. I'm the Extension Beef Cattle Specialist for our Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, located at our Overton Center, just east of Tyler. Uh, and tonight's topic for the Ag in the Evening series hosted by Houston Gregg and Trinity Counties is going to be supplementation basics for cow-calf operations. So when we think about protein and energy supplementation for beef cattle, there's going to be three primary things that are going to affect how much it, we need to supplement, what's going to affect those requirements. So one of those things is going to be the body condition score of those cows. So they thin, are they in adequate condition, or maybe they're carrying a little extra condition that we could potentially use if needed. What are their nutrient requirements? Are they dry cows? Are they lactating cows? Uh, that will... Are they light milking cows or the heavy milking cows? And we'll talk about some of that. And then a big one and a, a challenge we're seeing with a lot of samples and a lot of people are, are likely going to experience this winter is forage quality isn't real great. And, and part of that's because of all the rain we had early in the year and just not being able to get that hay cut in a timely manner. So when we think about those three primary things, we'll start with body condition score. And remember with body condition score, that ranges from one to nine, with one being really, really thin and nine being really, really fat. We're gonna start with the body condition score four and kind of work through the middle of the scale because that's really where we need to be thinking most of the time. If they're below a four, they're definitely thinner than what we would like them to see. And when we're looking at that body condition score for cow, a lot of times you can see that last rib or two on those cows, depending on how much hair they have, it's a little easier, a little harder to see on some. If we look right in front of their hook bone, or some people call it that hip bone, you can see where the transverse spinous processes are. We can't count those. We do have a little bit of muscle between each one of those transverse spinous processes, but it just looks like a thin little shelf there. And then you can see the top of the spine or what we would call the spinous process there. That's where we get a T-bone. So if you look at that area and think, man, I'm gonna have to eat several T-bone steaks to get full, those pet cows could probably lose, use a little more condition. If we look from hooks to pins right here, you can see that's kind of caved in a little bit. We have some muscle tissue loss. And then that pin bone, you can see it a little more prominently. So that's kind of a good example of body condition score for a cow. We definitely don't want those cows getting any lower than that. And really the only time we're, we're thinking about it being okay for them to be a body condition score four is when they're getting ready to wean off a really big calf. So we wouldn't want them in that kind of condition going into the winter or uh, right when they have a calf, just when they're getting ready to wean a big calf. Look at a body condition score five cow, we can't see any ribs. This cow is an extremely heavy muscle, but she's filled back in with some muscle over those transverse spinous processes. From hooks to pins, she's filled back in with some muscle, but we don't have any excess fat over the tail head. We don't really have any excess fat down in the brisket either. So body condition score five cow. Body condition score six cow. Can't see any ribs on her from hooks to pins. She's completely filled in with muscle. But then if we look, on each side of that tail head there, we can see that fat pone. And so on this replacement heifer here, and body condition score works the same on heifers as it does on cows. Um, think about an orange being cut in half. And on each side of the tail head, if we have an orange, that's a good indication of a body condition score six there. And if we look at this cow, definitely carrying more condition, we go to that fat pone there kind of think about a cantaloupe cut in half and on each side of the tail head and then you'll start seeing a little more fat down in the brisket and if you were to look over top of those cows they start becoming a little bit more square and a little less round over the top but that would be a, a body condition score seven why is that so important why are we thinking about that as part of our winter feeding program because body condition score is going to have a huge impact on our pregnancy rates. And what we're really thinking about is body condition score at or just prior to calving. And so you can see this is a work from Florida, but all the research that's been done on body condition score shows the same pattern 
low body condition score, low pregnancy rates. As we increase that body condition score, we improve those pregnancy rates. And so what that tells us is in this situation for mature cows, and for the purpose of this discussion, we'll call a mature cow four years of age or older. I want those cows to be in a minimum of a body condition score of five or greater at or just prior to calving. So five or greater is what we're shooting for. Uh, if we're looking at two and three year old females, we really want them six or greater at or just prior to calving. Uh, so if you think about spring calving cows, we really need to go into the winter in that kind of condition because it's gonna be hard to put weight on them during the winter. The other place body condition score is really important from a winter standpoint is it, those cows are in better body condition, that six, that seven, it provides them more insulation. So when we have cold, wet weather, they can handle that much better than that cow that's a little thinner. Now, when we think about body condition score, we're not gonna hold it steady all year. We can let it fluctuate, that's fine. So if we look at kind of a, a late winter Kevin cow here, start her off, notice I started her even better than that five because that five was the bare minimum for those mature cows. Start her in good condition from Kevin to weaning, she's typically going to lose some weight there. And then roughly we'll have 90 to maybe 120 days to get weight back on her before we go into the winter. And then we're holding her steady. Now, peak lactation, that would be about 60 days after those cows calve. That's when they're producing the most milk. And that's when their nutrient requirements are going to be the highest. So speaking of those nutrient requirements, the two big things we're gonna be thinking about tonight are gonna to be crude protein and TDN. And when I say TDN, realize, realize that stands for total digestible nutrients. When I say energy or TDN, I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably tonight. If we were talking about people, we would be talking about calories. So the way this table is set up is if we let that cow eat all the hay or all the grass she wants, what quality do we need it to be so we're holding her steady? She's not gaining weight, she's not losing weight. So at peak lactation for those two-year-old females, they would need a diet that's 11.5% crude protein and 60% TDN to hold them steady. Three-year-old lactating cows at peak lactation because they actually, they're not growing quite as much, but they're producing a little more milk. Their requirements actually a little bit higher. So 12.5% protein, 61 percent TDN. And then if we look at a um, mature cow at peak lactation, about 12.5% protein, 61% TDN. So if you'll just kind of remember when we're dealing with lactating cows, they're actually pretty similar, but we're going to need somewhere in the neighborhood of a, at least 11.5 to 12.5% crude protein and 60 to 61% TDN. Now, when we think about that dry cow before she has that calf, so she's not producing any milk, a couple of weeks before calving, that three-year-old dry cow or that coming three-year-old, I should say, would be about 9% protein, 58% TDN. The mature cow about two weeks before calving, 8.5% protein, 55% TDN. So you can see we need a higher quality diet or potentially more supplementation for those lactating cows than we do the dry cows. Now, all that's assuming the cows are in a body condition score five. The question is, what happens if the cows look like this? Well, hopefully you're looking at that cow and thinking, you didn't show us anything that thin when we were talking about body condition scores earlier, and I didn't. This cow is, is definitely too thin here. So in a situation like this, we would need to meet those nutrient requirements, but then we would also need to feed that cow some extra to get her to gain some condition back in that scenario. Now on the flip side of that, if we have some cows that are in really good condition and we get our hay test back and it shows we're just a little bit short on energy, we may not need to supplement those cows energy. We can let them use some of that extra body condition they have to make up for that difference. Uh, so that's one of the benefits of having those cows in good condition is we can let them use some of that extra condition to make up for any potential deficits as long as they're not too big. Now, the third thing in the equation, and we talked about this a little bit back in July for those who joined then, but I think it's important enough I wanna revisit it tonight just briefly, 
is forge quality. And some, the three big things that are gonna affect forge quality are gonna be the species of forge we're dealing with, the maturity, so how long has that forage been growing before we get ready to use it? And then what is the temperature during the growing period? And, and we'll look at that in more detail here in just a second. So some general guidelines when we're thinking about forage quality is cool season forages tend to be higher quality than warm season forages. Annual forages tend to be higher quality than perennial forages. And forages grown in arid environments tend to be higher quality than forages grown in humid environments. So if we were to just to kind of put some numbers on that to, to kind of break it down a little bit more, and these would be average daily gains for our, uh, steers, stocker steers, or even replacement heifers, but to kind of show you the differences. And while the cows may not gain this amount of weight, it will show you the quality differences of these species. So if we're looking at something like Tifton 85, and remember that's not straight Bermuda grass, it's a Bermuda grass star grass cross, would expect those growing animals to gain one to about one six a day or overall blue stems. So these would be things like WWB doll, Clayberg blue stem, Plains blue stem, King Ranch blue stem. These are introduced blue stems typically from Asia. And we do see quite a variation in quality among those because there's so many in that group. But again, they would fit in that one to 1 1.6 pounds a day. If we're looking at things like Bermuda grass and Bahia grass, typically we're thinking about three quarters to a pound and a quarter a day. Uh, Dallas grass would fit in that category as well. So that's kind of what we're looking at from a warm season perennial standpoint. Uh, when we look at warm season annuals, um, so if you were to plant something like some sorghum sudan or some sudan grass, or maybe you had access to some hay made from that, we're talking about a higher quality forage animal gain two to 2.75 pounds a day. So if I had the choice a lot of times between buying sorghum sudan hay versus Bermuda grass hay, from an energy standpoint for cows, that sorghum sudan hay is gonna be better than that Bermuda grass hay in pretty much all situations uh, with a few uh, exceptions. If we thought about things like crabgrass or pearl millet, they would fit in that pound and a quarter to two pounds a day. So question is, uh, where does vasey grass fit? And we don't have a lot of data uh, on vasey grass, pretty much not much at all. But based on what information we do have, I would put it in that category with our Bermuda grass or Bahia grass and our Dallas grass of that three quarters of a pound a day to a pound and a quarter a day for that vasey grass. Um, so crabgrass is something a lot of people kind of get frustrated with at times. I guess the one nice thing about it, while it may be a little harder to make hay because you do have to let it dry a little bit longer, that crabgrass is gonna be a higher quality than Bermuda grass a lot of times. When we look at our cool season annuals, um, so while they're growing, um, whether it be ryegrass or whether it be one of the small grains like uh, rye, wheat, or oats, we're typically looking in that pound and a half to 2.85 pounds a day. So again, higher quality forage than our, our warm season uh, perennial forages. Now maturity was the next thing I really wanted to kind of focus in there. And so uh, this is some work done out of Georgia. Uh, the yields they saw are gonna be a little higher than what we will see here because of the increased rainfall and their growing seasons uh, a little bit more conducive at times uh, than, than what we may see here but we still see the same pattern in quality. So this was some work done by Dr. Glenn Burton, who was actually a gentleman who bred both Coastal and Tifton 85. Um, and they looked at if they cut their hay every three weeks, every four weeks, every five weeks, et cetera, what did it do from a quality standpoint and what did it do from a yield standpoint? So this would be quality averaged across multiple cuttings throughout the year. So if they cut it every three weeks, you could see they're a little over 65% TDN. Every four weeks, a little under 62. Every five weeks, about 59. Bottom line is the more mature that forage gets, the lower the quality. And that's what we're seeing in a lot of samples this year 
is earlier in the year when it was a little hard to get in there on a timely manner and get it cut, that forage quality is dropping. The other thing to realize here, and I want to point out, because some people, they just really focus on yield and don't think about quality as much as they need to, is what we find is after a certain point, we don't increase yield anymore by waiting longer between cuttings. Plus, we continue to see that quality go down. So if you look at this here, whether they cut every six weeks, eight weeks, or 12 weeks, they really didn't see any meaningful change in how much forage they produce there. So what we really want to kind of shoot at to get a good balance of yield and quality is if we can cut every four to five weeks, we're going to be much better off in that situation from a quality standpoint and still get reasonable yields as well. I mentioned temperature, and this is one that always surprises people, and this is independent of rain, okay? So even if we had a center period of vivid irrigation and we were putting water at all the time, we would see this pattern. So this is some work uh, done at the Overton Center, and they looked at digestibility, and the more digestible, the more energy is going to be in that forage, and they were looking at coastal Bermuda, common Bermuda grass, and then Pensacola, Bahia grass, and you can see here in the spring that quality is really high. As we get into the summer, that quality goes down. And the reason that quality is going down is because the higher the temperatures are, that plant puts a compound or increases the amount of lignin it deposits, and lignin reduces digestibility. And then you can see as temperatures start to cool off in the fall, that quality starts coming back up in that situation. And so let's just say we had four cuttings of hay we could take a year. A lot of people uh, want that second and that third cutting because they tend to be real pretty. But from a nutrient standpoint and energy standpoint for that cow, that second and third cutting hay is often going to be our lower quality hay. So just want to maybe keep that in mind when you're uh, buying or selling hay or deciding what hay you want to use on what group of animals. But when we get in the summer, even if we got plenty of moisture, just because of the heat, we're going to see the quality go down. When we test that hay, it's critical that we get it sent to a lab that can test for the things we need to look at. Uh, the lab I will send samples to is the Dairy One Forage Lab in New York. They can get us a good estimate of TDN, and then also they can check for heat damage if we rolled that hay a little bit too wet. Uh, saw a lot of samples over the last few years of hay that was rolled up a little too wet and we had some heat damage that tied up some protein as well as reducing energy there. Unfortunately, the labs uh, in Texas just don't uh, have the same procedures in place to, to look at that. So that's one of the big reasons I send those to the Dairy One lab there in New York. The biggest thing I could tell you is just make sure you before you send those samples off, uh, whoever you're going to seek advice from, whatever nutritionist, whether it's me or somebody else, just make sure we have a conversation and get the right lab established and make sure we get the right tests for the, the samples you're looking at. So good question is how close to feeding should you test that? Hey, is it okay to go ahead and test now or should you wait until November, December? Uh, now it's fine. I, I, I typically will think about testing in September, or October. Uh, the big thing is I just don't want to test it too quickly after you bail it. We need to let it go through that curing process. If you test it too quickly after bailing, uh, we can potentially miss some things that we need to pick up. So I'd say let's give it at least four to six weeks after we cut it before we test it. Uh, but after that, go ahead and test it when it's convenient for you. Once we get it in that hay yard, while we may get a little weathering on the outside, the majority of that bell is really not going to change in quality. So if you kind of want to wait till September or October till you get the majority of your hay cut, you want to go ahead and send it off and test it at that point in time so that you have a little time to make some plans for this winter, that's absolutely fine. We don't need to, to wait till right before we start feeding it. Now, when we get that test back, there's going to be a couple things we need to look at. There, there's a lot on the paperwork, but the, the things that we really want to focus on are adjusted crude protein and always look at this dry matter column. Don't worry about as fed. Always look at dry matter. So you can see here 12.2. 
So that tells us for a dry cow, we don't need any protein supplement. For a wet cow, we're kind of right there borderline. We may need to give her just a little bit, but not too much. And the reason we look at that adjusted crude protein, you notice here that crude protein and adjusted are the same. If we have some of that heat damage I talked about, that adjusted crude protein value would be lower. And then TDN is going to be the other value we want to focus in on. Now, if we're grazing, it really doesn't make sense to spend money on testing that forage because it's changing and we're going to sample a little different than what that cow would actually graze. So to help give us an idea of how we may need to supplement this fall before we start feeding that hay, we can look at a few things. And one of those is forage species. And so we talked about that earlier, growing conditions. So how mature is that forage? What time of year is it? And the other thing you can look at that works really well to tell us if we need protein supplementation or not is fecal consistency. So if you look at that manure patty like the one uh, on the top right hand side here and it hits the ground and kind of splatters, that tells me we have plenty of protein in the diet. We don't need to supplement any protein. Chances are we're probably in pretty good shape on energy as well. On the flip side of that, if we see that manure patty, like the one on the bottom left hand here, that's kind of hitting the ground and stacking up and getting tall and firm, that tells me those cows could definitely benefit from a little bit of protein supplementation. And depending on the body condition score of the cows, we may or may not need some energy supplementation as well. So those manure patties can be real good indicators for you. Uh, some of you may have just started seeing some of those patties stack as the, the rain has kind of eased up um, and that forage isn't growing quite as well as what it was a month or so ago. So really watch that here in the next couple of weeks. Those patties may start stacking up. We may need a little protein supplementation this fall. Now, when we think about supplementation and feeding scenarios, we'll talk about a few different options. Uh, everybody likes cheap and easy. Unfortunately, that one really doesn't exist when we're thinking about hay feeding scenarios. So we'll talk about some other situations if you're feeding hay. We'll talk about easiest and least expensive uh, frequent labor um, when needed and maybe a little less expensive per unit of nutrient. And then if we have we don't have consistent labor, meaning we can't get out there and feed those cows multiple times a week, what are some options there? And we're probably looking at a little more cost per unit of nutrient. So by far the easiest and least expensive is good grass or good hay. If we have good grass or good hay and it meets the nutrient requirements, we don't have to worry about protein and energy supplements. All we're gonna do is provide those cows with a good loose mineral supplement, which is really where we should be the majority of the year is just uh, with good forage management is just crazing that forage. Now we can do the same thing during the winter if we put up good enough quality hay. So if that hay is good enough quality, we don't have to supplement it with protein and energy. And so that's why we really want to work us on that or focus on producing some good quality hay or for buying hay, make sure uh, we buy some better quality hay. And I know the temptation has been there maybe not to spend as much on fertilizer this year because it's increased a little bit. But when you work through the math, that money spent on fertilizer is much cheaper there than to not fertilize that hay and have lower quality hay and have to buy more supplementation on the back end. So just don't immediately say, I'm not gonna fertilize, really think what that means if you have to supplement additional in the long run. So easiest and least expensive is good quality forage that doesn't require supplementation. And yes, you can get hay that's, that's good enough, especially on dry cow, pretty easy to do that. Lactating cow, you have to work a little harder, but you can get that hay that's good enough if, if you put that effort in. What do we need to do if we have to supplement those cows because our forage isn't good enough? So for most cow-calf operations, when we're looking at protein and energy supplements, they're generally gonna be needed late summer when that forage quality declines. So delayed a little bit this year, but that's that manure patties I was talking about stacking up earlier, and then potentially during the winter, depending on the quality of the hay or if we have any winter pasture planted. So when we think about supplements, um, I'm going to break them up into three groups. So feeds that we typically use to supply protein, 
feeds that we typically use to supply energy are feeds that are a good source of both protein and energy. So realize basically all feeds have both protein and energy, but because of a concentration standpoint or from a cost standpoint, they fit into one of these three categories. So if we get our results back and we look at the nutrient requirements of those cows and we're okay on protein, but we just need a little bit of energy, the sources we would typically think about are things like whole corn, 11 to 14% cubes, assuming they're low fiber, and, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Soybean hulls, wheat mids, rice bran all fit into that group well. Just make sure you start off at a low level and then gradually increase how much you feed in the diet and that we stay very consistent with these energy sources. If we need both protein and energy, 20% cubes fit that uh, window well. Corn gluten feed, distiller's grains. If we plant some winter pasture, we can limit graze that winter pasture and it fits well. Whole cotton seed can fit uh, on the cow side of things. Just make sure we don't feed more than about 25% of the diet or about six to eight pounds per cow because we can get too much fat in the diet and that can cause us some problems there. Uh, just like with the energy supplements, we need to start off slow and gradually increase how much we have in the diet. When we look at protein sources, uh, cottonseed meal is a great option. Uh, our 38 or 40 percent cubes, which are just straight cottonseed meal cubes, it's just some companies will tag them as a 38 and some will tag them as a 40. Uh, soybean meal normally doesn't price, but I actually priced it uh, for a family operation uh, last week, and it's actually pricing a little bit better, at least where I was purchasing it then cottonseed meal, so we bought some soybean meal. Uh, sunflower meal, uh, just make sure you're looking for the one that's at least 35% protein. There's some various options out there, but it can price in decently in some situations. Canola meal, the winter pasture again. Alfalfa hay works great for a protein supplement, not so well for an energy supplement. Unfortunately, it hasn't priced real well for us the last several years. And then a limited amount of urea in the right situation can work to supply some protein for us as well. So really where I'm gonna talk about now is hand-fed supplements versus self-fed. So we'll start with the hand-fed supplements. So some things there is when we're hand-feeding those cows, I mean, we may be using a cake feeder or we may just be dumping it out of a sack, whichever. Um, it's easy to increase or decrease the amount depending on what the cows need. There tends to be a lot of options to choose from. Often they're going to be cheaper per unit of nutrient, especially TDN. We may have a little bit more labor required, so depending on how you price your labor there. Um, and two of the hand-fed supplements that we can use quite a bit are cottonseed meal. Remember, great protein supplement. Whole corn, great energy supplement, uh, whole shell corn, I should say. And again, anytime you're using energy supplement, start off slow and gradually increase. If you needed both protein and energy, we could use those too. Uh, if you just mixed about a third cottonseed meal to two thirds whole shell corn, that would give you a feed that's just under 21% protein, 80, about 84% TDN which is considerably higher than what we'll see on most uh, cubes. The highest cubes we'll typically see are gonna be more in that 75 to 77% range. So that's an option you could use if you wanted to. And you wouldn't necessarily have to mix them the way I would feed them is put the corn down in the bunk and then I can just put the cottonseed meal or soybean meal if that was what I was using on top of it. Um, cubes are something a lot of folks use. They work well from a convenience standpoint. They give us flexibility to feed in the bunks or on the ground. Typically when we're talking about cubes, they're gonna be three quarters of an inch or seven eighths inch in diameter. Pellets will range from an eight to a quarter to three eighths inch in diameter. The important thing to realize is whether it's a cube or pellet really doesn't tell us about quality. A lot of times we'll see the exact same feed mix put in a cube and in a pellet. It's just kind of how we're gonna feed that. 
Um, the pellets work a little bit better if we're needing to feed calves. Those cubes, sometimes they don't eat as well. If we have to feed on the ground, then we definitely have to go with the cube and not a pellet in that situation. So I mentioned we'll talk about some cubes uh, here. It's important you really pay attention to what you're buying so you, you get the best value when you're gonna make that purchase. So this is an example from a company here in East Texas. Uh, they make several different versions of cubes. So from a protein supplement, they make a 38% cottonseed meal cube, just like we talked about earlier. We need protein, that works really well. If we can't get out there and feed cows daily, that's something that's gonna work well also. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, they happen to sell three different versions of a 20% cube. So they're all 20% protein. So how do we tell the difference of them based on what's on the feed tag? So unfortunately, they don't put TDN on feed tag. That would be really nice if they do, but they don't. Uh, some companies will put it online. So you may check online and see if they give you that information. The thing we can look at that will really give us an idea is we can look at the crude fiber level. Um, and so if we look at these, this first cube is a 20% uh, true protein cube here. You can see 72% TDN. Here's a key thing is crude fibers max 10%. Really from a supplementation standpoint, we don't want that crude fiber to be over about 10 to 11%. It just drops the energy value in the feeds too much. So again, here's another 20% uh, true protein or, or natural protein, same thing there, uh, Q. But notice the TDN on this one, 57%, big difference. And think about those nutrient requirements we talked about. So this cube right here, we would be going backwards on a lactating cow. We could never supplement enough to really help that cow. On a dry cow, if we let her eat nothing but that cube, we could kind of keep her steady. So really doesn't help us from a supplementation standpoint because it just doesn't have enough energy. So that's why we have to watch that crude fiber number because uh, we can get something that may be all right to call the cows in the pen, but really is not designed uh, to work well from a supplementation standpoint. This is one that has some non-protein nitrogen in it along with the crude fiber being too high. So again, this TDN is too low. So even though there's three 20% cubes here, the only one that really helps us from a supplementation standpoint is this one over here that had 10% crude fiber as that max level. So really check those feed tags and pay attention to that crude fiber. And that crude fiber on most of our sack feeds is going to be much, much more important to look at than fat. Everybody wants to get hung up on fat, but what you really need to be looking at is that crude fiber value. If we look at what we would kind of call an energy type feed or an energy type cube, so you can see both of these are 12%. This one, those max 8% crude fiber, so that TDN is much better than this one that's 18% crude fiber. Again, really doesn't help us from a supplementation standpoint. Some other cubes we are seeing a little more the last couple of years is there's some companies who've worked out the process to actually take uh, distillers dry grains or DDG and make that into a cube. Um, one of the ones in Texas we see that with is uh, Diamond Nutrition out of Level Land. Um, and then there's some dealers uh, throughout parts of Texas that are are bringing in a cube from Kansas and Nebraska Distillers Greens cube. Um, typically, we'll be talking um, when, with those DD, DDG cubes, they're going to have quite a bit more energy in them. And from a protein standpoint, uh, depending on how they tag them, oftentimes we'll be looking in excess of 30% protein on those DDG cubes. But again, just like everything else we've talked about, with the exception of our protein sources, we need to start off slow and gradually increase the amount. Some other considerations when dealing with cubes or pellets, uh, rarely is, if they call it a forage extender cube, is it going to be a good option? That's, if we're trying to extend forage, it's actually not what we want to use, contrary to the name. They're just too low in TDN. Uh, cubes are rarely going to be a good effective roughage source. So again, don't work well to uh, substitute 
for all your hay. Um, we do want to pay attention to the crude, or the, excuse me, the calcium phosphorus ratio sometimes. I uh, just like to see a little more calcium than phosphorus. Don't have to worry about it so much in East Texas, but if you're running some cattle uh, further west and they're on some dormant native forage, then if they add a little potassium back into those cubes, that could be beneficial in that situation. Don't have to worry about that with our forages here in East Texas. If we look at some of our self-fed supplements, so some considerations there is it can be very hard to change how much is consumed. So those products are often designed for those cows to eat so much. And in some situations that may not be enough to make up for our deficiencies, um, especially if those animals are consuming low quality forages. A lot of these self-fed feeds, they just cannot eat enough to make up that difference. Uh, less options to choose from, they could require less labor. For a lot of them, like if we're looking at a tub or a liquid feed, uh, because of the way the intake works there, uh, really probably best to feed those year round if that's gonna be the option you're going to. So when we look at tubs, there's gonna be two basic types of tubs we'll see on the market. Uh, those that are made with molasses and urea and then those that are made out of distiller's grains. Uh, the thing is with the majority of these tubs, when I talked about that intake being low, we're talking a half a pound to a pound and a half in most situations is kind of our max. And we'll see when we look at some amounts of feed later on that, as I mentioned, a lot of times the cows just cannot eat enough of that tub to make up for our shortages. When we look at liquid feeds, uh, the two bases we'll typically see is molasses with urea or some other form of non-protein nitrogen. And then there's at least one product out there that uses some distiller solubles uh, and non-protein nitrogen. Um, intake about one to three pounds, but it's important to realize that the water content can range from 35 to about 65% on a lot of these products. So let's just say, it, it was 50% water, then you take that one to three pounds I was talking about in consumption and cut that in half. So again, we're back to that half a pound to a pound and a half, and that just may not be enough to make up for those shortages. Um, so some additional thoughts there. I'm harping on the intake and because if we got low quality forage, it's, it, we're just getting a bind with these type products. Uh, that dry matter intake is generally too low on most of them. Definitely not a good option for thin cattle where they work a little bit better is if you have cows in good shape and you just need a little bit of protein supplement, that's where those liquid feeds and tubs definitely fit better for us. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, best to feed them year round. And, and part of the reason there too is is hopefully we help keep those cows in a little bit better body condition. So maybe we have a little bit of reserves that we can help pull off of, but that still may not be enough. But if you are gonna use liquid feeds and tubs, that's typically the way we think about them. The other thing when we think about the liquid feeds, there is the potential if you can buy in a truckload lot, which we're typically talking 48 to 50,000 pounds, you may be able to get a custom formulation with a little bit higher intake in those situations. Now there are some uh, feeders out there that we can use if you need a self-fed option to get a little more intake in those cattle potentially. Obviously there's some cost associated with that. So you just have to figure out what works for your situation. Uh, these are some that hit the market several years ago. Um, it's called an auto easy feeder. And the way they work is they have a timer. And so you set that timer based off how many times a day you set it to go off and how long that determines how much is fed. Um, seeing quite a bit of use of these out of seed stock producers and bull development because it gives them a little more flexibility on some feed options. Also seeing them used in some cow-calf operations. Uh, just have to look at the expense and see if that fits for you or not. And then make sure we keep enough bump space so when that timer goes off that all those cows can get around there and eat at once if you're gonna go with that option. 
but if you go with something like this, you don't have to have a limiter like we're going to talk about on the next slide. So a lot of people want to try to use bulk feeders like this. You have to be very, very careful and get this done right, or you can have a major wreck. And when I mean a major wreck, there's been several seed stock producers over the years who've had to cancel a bull sale because they didn't get it done right with this kind of a feeder and they got a lot of foot abscesses and founder in those bulls. Uh, making those bulls unusable so they you know had to be taken to slaughter at that point in time if you're going to try to use something like this it is critical you get a limiter in there and you talk with the company nutritionist to make sure you get it done correctly so you may be saying well why can't you tell me how to how to do it you're a nutritionist I and mean, i am but i don't have access to all the company data uh, so you really need access to that data to make the right recommendations. So if you're going to go that route and those limiters do, do cost some money, uh, make sure you're talking with an actual nutritionist, not just a rep, but a nutritionist from Cargill or Purina and make sure you get that done right so you don't wreck a bunch of cows accidentally. So what are kind of some starting points if we need to supplement cows? So let's say we sent our hay off and it came back from dairy one and it was 45% TDN, 5% protein, pretty low quality hay there. Um, on a dry cow, just to maintain her body condition score, so we're, we're not increasing or any, it would take eight pounds of a 20% cube a day. So like on a cow like this, if she can only eat a pound and a half a tub or she can only eat three pounds of a liquid feed that has quite a bit of water in it, we're not gonna get anywhere close to the amount of feed we need to keep those cows in anywhere of any kind of decent body condition. If we look at a lactating cow, we're gonna let her lose some weight, but we're gonna control that weight loss so she doesn't lose too much too quick. Uh, 11 pounds of a 20% cube there. So I think you can see real easy here that with the amount of feed we have to feed, there's a real benefit of working on that hay or quality or that forage quality to make sure we keep that up. If we look at hay that's a little bit better, and this is where I'm seeing a lot of hay this year is kind of in that 50% TDN range, about six to 7% crude protein. A dry cow, assuming she's in okay condition and we just need to maintain it, four pounds of a 20% cube a day. So again, she still can't eat enough of some of those self-fed products. Uh, lactating cow, control or weight loss. We're actually gonna switch over to a 40 here. It allows us to drop the intake a little bit because the TDN is a little bit higher, but we still need some more protein. So six pounds of a 40% cube a day. If you thought about nitrogen fertilizer and what it would take to bump that protein up in that hay, that would have been a much cheaper option to go ahead and, and spend some more money on fertilizer than to feed the six pounds of a 40% cube a day. And so the way you could kind of think about that is, is for the last several years, nitrogen has been running about 45 to 50 cents a pound. Uh, depending on where you're getting it, you're probably looking in the neighborhood of 75 to 80 cents, uh, maybe even 85 cents a pound right now. So we'll, we'll just go on the higher end and say 80 cents a pound of nitrogen. So in a hay situation with Bermuda grass, assuming we're not deficient on other plant nutrients, for each pound of nitrogen we put out there kind of in our environment, we would expect to get somewhere between 20 and maybe up to 40 pounds of additional forage for that one pound of nitrogen. So let's just use a conservative number in our mass. So let's say for every pound of nitrogen, we got 25. So potential for more, but for our budgeting, we're gonna think 25 pounds of forage. So if I spent money on two pounds of nitrogen and got 25 pounds of forage for each one, so two pounds of nitrogen would give me 50 pounds of forage at 80 cents a pound that only cost me a buck 60. Okay. 
And I'm, I'm talking about something that's probably going to meet the protein requirements of those cows for sure. If a fertilizer is right, it'd be much better off from an energy standpoint. So a buck 60 to get 50 pounds of forage that's in good shape on protein compared to if I'm buying 20% cubes or 48% cubes, fertilizer still prices out pretty well in that situation. Now I realize it may be too late on some of the hay this year, but if you're gonna stockpile some winter forage, go ahead and get some nitrogen on it. If you're planting some winter pasture, get some nitrogen on it. And then next year we can work on that hay again. So if we look at better quality hay, 55% uh, TDN, 9% protein, dry cow, all she needs is the hay. We don't need to feed her anything else. If we look at a lactating cow to control weight loss, we're looking at two pounds of a 40% cube a day. That's very doable in that situation. So hay quality really has a huge impact on how we need to supplement. So those are kind of some starting points. Now we want to remember that depending on our weather conditions and other things, we just need to make sure we monitor those cows and adjust that supplementation up or down if we're seeing those cows. Maybe they're doing better than we expected. We could cut back a little bit or maybe they're just not doing as good. So we need to bump that up a little bit. We can look at those starting spots and then work from there. How often do we need to supplement? It really depends on what feedstuffs we're going to use. And it's really important that, that we're clear here and everybody hears this uh, correctly so we don't have any mistakes. Is if we're using a protein supplement, so something like cottonseed meal, soybean meal, that 38 or 40 percent cube, and we don't have any kind of additives or non protein nitrogen in it. Research would show us that in most situations, we could feed every day, every other day, twice a week, or in some situations, once a week, and get the same amount of performance. So let's say we were in that scenario on the, like the last one where we were looking at that, that lactating cow needed two pounds of a 40% cube a day, all right? And that's 14 a week. So we could feed two pounds every day, we could feed 4.7 pounds three times a week, would get us to our 14. We could go seven pounds twice a week. I'm gonna tell you, I'm not a fan of going 14 once a week. If I only needed a pound a day and so seven a week, I'd feel okay with that, but 14, I would rather break that up into two feedings. So that gives us some flexibility that if we need a protein supplement, we don't necessarily have to feed those cattle every day. But again, cottonseed meal, soybean meal, 40% cubes is what we're looking at. We can't do that with the majority of feeds out there. When we're looking at the majority of other feeds, we're looking at our energy supplements or a combination energy and protein supplements. We really, really need to feed those every day. Feeding at less frequent intervals can really lead to some problems. Um, even if we don't have major problems from an acidosis standpoint and a founder or foot abscess standpoint, we know the cattle just don't get as much out of the feed. There's a couple of different research studies that have shown that. So energy or combination of energy and protein supplements, really best to feed daily. This kind of highlights why we need to feed those feeds daily. So acidosis is the pH in the rumen getting too low. So this was some work done at Oklahoma State. And so they showed rumen pH uh, over time here. And then I went ahead and put the corresponding average daily gains in here. So the red line is they just, the, these were some uh, heifers were just getting forward. So they weren't feeding any feed. You can see we do see some variation in rumen pH. That's normal, but it hasn't gotten too low. If they looked at feeding every day, okay, we see that room and pH drop here and then it kind of comes back up. Performance was about 1.7 pounds a day. Every other day, that room and pH dropped even more, okay, until we got out to 48 hours and then that cycle would repeat itself. But you can see even feeding the same amount of feed, but going from every day to every other day, we got less performance out of those heifers. 
we'd expect the same thing if we were doing this with cows. And then if they fed every third day, so they, they tripled the amount of feed on the day they're feeding, so it would all equal out, you can see that room and pH gets even lower and look how much average daily gain we gave up. We gave up over three tenths of a pound by not feeding that every day, even though those heifers got the same amount of feed per week. So that's one of those energy or those combination energy and protein feeds from a rumen health standpoint, and then from an efficiency standpoint, really best to feed daily. Now, one question that comes up a lot is, what if you're an offsite landowner and you can't get out there um, but once or twice a week, what are your options? And unfortunately, the options get limited pretty quick, pretty fast. Uh, what you really want to focus on there is good quality hay. And then if you can plant some winter pasture, uh, especially um, if you have fall or winter cabin cows, that works better. It doesn't work quite as well when we talk about spring cabin cows because we can't graze them full time on that winter pasture during late gestation. But offside landowners, let's just say we were dealing with dry cows uh, and we were dealing with low quality hay that didn't meet the needs and we were in one of those situations where we have been to, if we could feed every day, we'd need to be feeding four to eight pounds of cubes. What would we attempt in that situation? So what I would, I, what I would attempt, and this isn't gonna solve the problem, but it will help is chances are you're probably already looking at a tub or a liquid feed. So pick one or the other and we put that out there that's not gonna make up for all the difference. So what we would probably do in that situation, if you went out there once a week, is just give them on top of that liquid feed or that tub they were getting is five pounds of a 40% cube once a week. Now, like I said, that's not gonna likely make up for all of our deficits, but at least that's a way we can make up for more of it uh, than not. If we're dealing with uh, a lactating cow, it becomes even more challenging. Uh, we're really looking at that same strategy above, but likely we're, those cows are just gonna lose more weight than, than we would want it to in those situations. So really on offsite landowners, it's important, to, to, it's important for everybody to focus on hay quality, but even more so there. And even if you gotta feed all the hay, it's still valuable to test it because if you got hay from more than one cutting or more than one person you purchased it from, we can figure out what hay is a little higher quality and use that when the nutrient requirements are a little higher for us. And then the last thing when we're pricing supplements, we just wanna make sure we price them for the nutrients we need. So if we need protein, okay, the way we would go about doing that is if we're looking at a 20% cube, if it costs us $10.30 a sack, so 50 pounds sack times 20% protein tells me there's 10 pounds of protein in that sack. That 10 pounds of protein costs me $10.30. So 1030 divided by 10 pounds of protein tells me each pound of protein costs me a dollar and three cents. Now in comparison, if I look at a 38% cube, yes, it costs me more per sack here, but I got quite a bit more protein. I got 19 pounds of protein in there. So 1355 divided by 19 pounds of protein, it's actually cheaper per unit of protein at about 71 cents there. So when we're pricing feeds, whether it's for protein or energy, and we can do the same thing when we're pricing energy, this is kind of the math we want to walk through or think through. So what's cheapest per sack, oftentimes is not cheapest per unit of nutrient. And with that, I'll be happy to entertain any questions anybody has. Feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat box or go ahead and unmute and ask those questions. Dr. Vanta, you were talking about waiting to test the forage until it had been cut for, I think you said maybe a month. Will testing it almost immediately after it was cut, which is what I did, affect the crude protein or the TDN? Chances are it, it may not affect the TDN so much a little bit, but it can definitely affect the crude protein if you put it up a little wet. 
And so if you put it up a little wet, we have some heating that goes on and we get what's called a Maillard reaction, which ties up that protein and some soluble carbohydrates, making them unavailable to the animal. And so if the hay wasn't put up too wet, you're probably in good shape. If the hay was potentially put up a little wet, then it may look like those protein values are a little bit higher than what they actually are. Uh, depending on what the protein is in the hay, if you want to send me a copy of the report, I can look at it. It may not be worth retesting, uh, but definitely in the future, we're better off if we can wait that four or six weeks. Okay, question that came in from the chat is on the uh, cottonseed milk cubes. Can I kind of indicate what that TDN typically is? It'll typically be 75 to 77 percent TDN on those cottonseed milk cubes. If you don't have any questions, feel free to go ahead and log off at any time. Uh, I will stay on for a few more minutes uh, in case there are some questions. And then I did want to let everybody know that our group met today and went ahead and scheduled pro upcoming programs out. The next Ag in the Evening event will be on October 12th. And Dr. Olson is going to talk about herbicides and, and making sure you got the right one at the right time and, and what that means from a price standpoint. And I know she's going to spend some time on Resilon. That's one that's been getting a lot of questions. And we've had some folks who uh, got a little frustrated there because they didn't get the whole story before they decided to use that and really need to use it twice. And maybe only they used it once or some people used it not realizing that it's going to impact their ryegrass or their other winter pasture moving forward. Uh, so she's gonna spend some more time to try to answer some of the questions on that herbicide and then some other ones on Tuesday, uh, October 12th. All right, well, I'm not seeing anything else. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap up for tonight. Thank you everybody for joining and everybody have a good week.